I'm John Sargent and welcome to Argumental, the show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Issues like, how many times can you not win the lottery before you accept those actually aren't your lucky numbers? <laughs> Why won't Penelope Cruz return any of my drawings? <laughs> and isn't it time we stepped in and said to Saddam Hussein, enough is enough? <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are our teams. In the red corner with Marcus Brigstock this week, it's Jimmy Carr. <laughs> and joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Sarah Millican. OK, let's kick off with round one, where we debate a big issue that simply isn't addressed enough on serious programmes like Flog It and The Hoobs. <laughs> Tonight, the subject under discussion is fishing. Fishing. We all love a fish supper on a Friday night, but that could soon be a thing of the past if we don't reel in our fishing habits. We're battering cod like nobody's business, and before too long, there'll be no life left in the sea. But are we really ready to give up on this kind of luxury? <laughs> But the issue I want the team to argue over is this. If a dolphin has to die so that I can have a tuna sandwich, then so be it. <laughs> Proposing this statement on behalf of the blue team, it's Sarah Millican. Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, with the fact that dolphins actually can't cure terminal illness. <laughs> In fact, it almost has the opposite effect. 85% of children who have terminal illness and have been put in a pool to swim with dolphins die within 48 hours of the experience. <laughs> What really has happened is that they've experienced what apparently is one of the best things you can ever experience, and they've gone. It's quite poor, that. <laughs> I think it's, it's almost about the fact that dolphins have better PR than tuna, don't they? They do. They have a better image. No, no Athena print ever came out of a tuna majestic at play, did it? No. <laughs> it was always dolphins and whales, cos whales are better still. It's like the scale, you know. Just, I think dolphins are, you know, slightly pathetic whales. <laughs> Where I'm going with that. Uh, <laughs> In case you don't know, there is a, a new foundation that's been uh, brought about um, for people who don't have as much money but still have children who are dying. It's like a budget foundation. And instead of swimming with dolphins, what you do is you have a bath with a tuna. <laughs> but I think, it, you know, it's, it's called bathing with tuna and it's from the Take a Fish Foundation. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. OK, next up, opposing the statement on behalf of the Red Team, it's Marcus. So, Marcus, how's you doing? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I know a lot about dolphins and I can tell you they need to be in a net like they need a hole in the head. <laughs> no, dolphins should be left in their natural habitat, a small, shallow pond dragging fat tourists around on the tip of their penis for money. <laughs> we love dolphins. The, si the dolphin symbol touches a chord with people. If you see a dolphin symbol on a can, it tells you that that's uh, dolphin-friendly. Juno, if you see a dolphin symbol on a, a woman's ankle, it tells you she has no imagination, but she'll probably do it on a first date. <laughs> uh, they have a prehensile penis, a penis able to dig and pick up small objects like rocks and stones. Imagine if people had that ability. Time Team would be unwatchable. <laughs> You went to buy your tuna sandwich and you got to the checkout and they said, there's your tuna sandwich. Oh, before you take it, we just want to show you something. And then they unveiled a big pool with a dolphin in it and a man standing at the edge going... <laughs> and the dolphin came swimming up and... <laughs> and then just as you were handed your sandwich, they went... <laughs> and shot it in the face. You wouldn't happily eat that sandwich. 
right? <laughs> it's only because it's in the water and we think we can't see it. You wouldn't eat a bacon sandwich if they showed you a video of the pig being murdered with a peacock. <laughs> Just out of interest, if a peacock and a pig were to murder a dolphin, how would that sound? <laughs> you wouldn't eat crisps if a kitten had to die. <laughs> There's less of a link on that one. The kind of fishing they do with these enormous nets. Imagine if we got sheep like that on land. Imagine if someone just got a huge vehicle with a net on it and just scooped up all the sheep <laughs> and a bus stop and a mobility scooter and a very angry Welsh mugger. Oh, bloody hell, I'm caught in a net like shit! <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't allow it to happen. And rightly so. Listen, you don't need to see dolphins die to provide you with a tuna sandwich. Killing dolphins serves no purpose. Thank you <laughs> both for the red team. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. So, Rufus and Jimmy, is there anything you'd like to say in support of your teammates? The thing is, a lot of this is based on the fact that people look at dolphins and they like dolphins. Dolphins are inherently likeable. But actually, there's another way of looking at dolphins. If you put that man's baseball cap on that dolphin, that is the chaviest creature in the water. <laughs> Walking around all the time, smiling, going, ha! <laughs> <laughs> Come here and do some work, and I'm going to jump through a hoop. I don't want to bat for your team, but the Marcus earlier, uh, you know, saying you wouldn't eat crisps if a kitten had to die, and I saw a number of our audience go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about Pringles here? <laughs> <laughs> if the only way to get Pringles out of the tube was to drive kittens in from the other end... <laughs> <laughs> ..and then you knew you'd run out of crisps. When, when you bit a kitten's face. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you all. So, is it OK for a dolphin to die so you can have a tuna sandwich? It's time for the studio audience to decide who made the best case. Hold up your blue card if you agree with Sarah. She thinks her tuna sandwich is more important than a dolphin, never mind being easier to fit in her lunchbox. <laughs> and hold up your red cards if Marcus convinced you that no sandwich should involve the death of a dolphin. Unless, of course, it's a dolphin sandwich. <laughs> so, vote blue for Sarah and red for Marcus. Vote now. Oh, that was so close. So, that looks like a victory for the red team. Well done, Marcus and Jimmy. They convinced our audience that there is no excuse for killing a dolphin for the sake of a tuna sandwich. If every time you make a tuna sandwich a dolphin dies, then I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you're making it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'm going to give one member of each team a statement which they must support until they hear this sound. At which point, they must perform a U-turn and argue against it, then flip-flop back and forth every time I press the buzzer. Jimmy and Rufus will play this one. Jimmy, you're up first. I'd like you to start off by arguing that Brits abroad are excellent cultural ambassadors. <laughs> what makes Britain great is our ability to laugh at ourselves, and when I say ourselves, I mean other people. When I say laugh, I mean invade. <laughs> people think British people are, are lazy, but it takes years of practice to throw patio furniture that far across a piazza. <laughs> Especially in the face of water cannon. <laughs> <laughs> We're not great cultural ambassadors, though. No, because... <laughs> we take our holidays very seriously in this country. Nothing makes me more proud to be British than, than seeing people doing shots of Zambuca and downing pints at 7am in a departure lounge. <laughs> A staggering 42% of us never talk to the locals, but once we've stopped staggering, we sober up and say, Pedro, two beeros, por favoro. <laughs> when I see the way British women um, portray themselves abroad, it makes me ashamed to be fucking them. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm joking a lot of the time. I am just filming from the... Anyway. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's awful the way that people think that British women aren't a good, good ambassadors for this country because we, you know, they go abroad and you, you frankly, ladies, you act like slants when you're abroad. But, <laughs> but it is true to be said, a lot of you do act like that when you're here. So, <laughs> you're remarkably consistent. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Well, flip flop. Personally, I spent all my time abroad at my Spanish holiday home. And the only language the poor boy there needs to understand is, wear shorter shorts. <laughs> <laughs> you remember, if you're in Amsterdam, it's illegal to piss in the canals unless you're pregnant. In my defence, I was so stoned that I thought I was. <laughs> OK, Rufus, you're up next. I'd like you to begin by arguing that it's better to live fast and die young. Uh, it's better to live fast there and die young, uh, which is not the same argument I should point out as only the good die young, as I was saying to Margaret Thatcher only the other day. Uh, <laughs> live fast and die young is about that rock and roll sensibility. It's about understanding that living is not the same as surviving, that life is vital, but merely existence is nothing. <laughs> Whereas that is wrong, as if you go to Bournemouth, you'll know. Uh, <laughs> Bournemouth is a town populated with zombies uh, who are so keen not to die that they would rather have their asses wiped than shuffle off this mortal coil. He's, uh, like, he's sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> you got no feelings, man? Uh, sorry, mate. Well, don't just sit there, Jimmy. Wipe his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Writing jokes for this round would have required me to show the sort of adult sensibility of realising that I was coming here today and that a bit of organisation, a bit of knuckling down would have done me quite good. But I was too busy fucking two whores. <laughs> was I smacked off my tits on heroin? Yes. <laughs> yes, I was. I was chasing the dragon. I punched a child. <laughs> but then that is because I live fast. <laughs> and I will die young. Well done, Rufus. Marcus and Jimmy, what did you make of Rufus's performance? It was good. It was sort of like seeing a man's midlife crisis in sort of a two minute chunk. <laughs> Okay. Would you rather have a child who accomplished great things but died at 40 or worked at a call centre until he was 80? 80. Really? Yeah. Why? You'd be very good in a call centre, wouldn't you? <laughs> I used to work in a call centre, that's why I want everybody else to have a go. <laughs> I can't help feeling living fast, maybe, but dying young, I think it may be a little bit late for all of us. <laughs> The Who aren't writing that song, are they? <laughs> I hope I get a nice sit down. <laughs> I don't know anyone who's lived really fast, although judging by the way Amanda Holden's skin is stretched across her face, she's clearly travelling at some speed. <laughs> <laughs> Time for the studio audience to decide who flipped and who flopped. If you thought Jimmy flip flopped best about Brits in their flip flops, vote red. But if you thought Rufus flip-flopped best about living fast and dying young, then vote blue. So it's red cards for Jimmy or blue cards for Rufus. Vote now. <laughs> so, a blue majority there. Commiserations to Jimmy, but congratulations to Rufus. <laughs> Join us after the break when we'll be asking whether God will forgive Richard Dawkins and finding out what sort of debate these two lovely ladies are going to help our panellists with. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, where there's so much confrontation, it's like the Jeremy Kyle show without the sovereign rings. <laughs> right, next up is Slime <laughs> One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue, but this time I want them to illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Marcus and Sarah, you're up for this one. Marcus, I'd like you to start by arguing that God will not forgive Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Here's your first picture. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, God will not forgive Richard Dawkins. He's already made that clear by giving him the voice of an elderly lady. <laughs> now, uh, I have two points that I'd like to make, and both can be represented in the form of toy mice. <laughs> That's lucky. Yes. <laughs> as we all know, does exist and regularly takes the form of a mouse in a gingham shirt and <laughs> not appear to be lederhosen. Who dressed these mice? <laughs> if indeed they are mice. So... Uh... <laughs> now, this argument is appearing at this stage to veer heavily to one side. <laughs> but I, I think that the foundations of it will keep it standing and I want a pizza. <laughs> uh... Yes, there we are, the chimpanzee, ladies and gentlemen, something that Richard Dawkins absolutely insists we are descended from. But as many, many, many a clever Christian has pointed out, if we're descended from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Well, because you've never read anything, you cretins. <laughs> <laughs> what is... is that...? What is that? <laughs> I think it's a lady's twinkle. <laughs> I've not seen one up close, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> See, that's what God is like. He's a murderous, judgmental, petty-minded, twisted, killing, barbaric moron. And he couldn't possibly understand a man as brilliant as Professor Dawkins. <laughs> oh. Thanks, Marcus. Sarah, I'd like you to argue the opposite, that God will forgive Richard Dawkins. Here's your first picture. <laughs> Uh, that Marcus, thank you, has clarified that Richard Dawkins is who I thought he was. I was getting the, him mixed up with Dan Brown. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, Peter O'Toole is also old, uh, much like uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, <laughs> and they were both in Lawrence of Arabia. Little known fact. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and also, God, uh, God will forgive uh, Hitler when he, we eventually find him. Who knows where he is? Uh, <laughs> I'm done, I don't know, like the idea that I'm putting Hitler in the same camp <laughs> <laughs> as Richard Dawkins. That doesn't feel entirely comfortable, but sod it. I'm carrying on. Uh, oh, uh, yes, of course, uh, heaven does exist. I don't really believe this, by the way. Uh, heaven does <laughs> exist. Just, like, just to clarify, I've been told to argue this. Shut up. And, uh, <laughs> the door. I think he's probably got staff for that, so I think people will sneak in. I think the only people who won't sneak in will be people who are wearing trainers and stag do's. Um, <laughs> or red. <laughs> I meant blue. <laughs> carried away with the Mein Kampf picture. Thanks, Sarah. Rufus and Jimmy, what have you got to add? Well, I mean, for all God's children, what's so special about Jesus? <laughs> He's a bit of a bit of a rebel. Hang around with twelve blokes, <laughs> hanging out with twelve guys in sandals. Hello, <laughs> fishermen, sailors. Hello. <laughs> so, will God forgive Richard Dawkins? It's time for our studio audience to decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Marcus and a blue one for Sarah. Vote now. Oh. <laughs> a clear victory for the Reds. Well done, Marcus. Mm. Rationality and science have won the day. Please convince the audience that God will not forgive Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins cannot defeat Jesus in any way. Wasn't it Jesus that said, if you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you could possibly imagine? No, sorry, that was Obi-Wan Kenobi, but the point still stands. <laughs> Christians believe God created us in his own image, so it's fair to assume he must look like Joe Brand, too. <laughs> it's on to our popular culture round now, where tonight's debate is on a topic which has often aroused my interest. Sexual fantasies. <laughs> That's right, sexual fantasies. We've all had them. 
Many of you at home are having one right now, and in case you're wondering, no, I'm not wearing any. <laughs> but what happens when fantasy and reality meet? Well, we're going to find out tonight with the help of our special guests, Portia and Stacy. <laughs> Jimmy, you're up first. Meet Portia and Stacey. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers. Um, I'm not sure how I should probably... I should probably stand... No, no, you're fine there. <laughs> so, what are we debating? <laughs> are we... We're definitely talking about something, aren't we? Yeah, and the statement I want you to argue is this. A threesome is better in the imagination than in real life. <laughs> is it, though? I might come into the forefront and argue this, because I'm getting slightly put off. Good. Um, right, not all um, the weird sexual stuff you hear about is, is, is as good as it's cracked up to be. I mean, you can tell me how great auto-asphyxiation is until you're blue in the face. <laughs> Where are my manners? Let me just explain that to the blondes. Turn blue, so to your blue in the face is a phrase that people use, so it's sort of like a joke. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> I think before I have sex with two women, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, want to experiment a little bit. I want to dip my toe in the water and have sex with one girl. <laughs> that one. <laughs> She's got a tattoo there. <laughs> and I like pictures. I think it is better in the mind. I, I told my girlfriend my ultimate sexual fantasy was to have two women at the same time, and she agreed, but then she was livid when I told her she wasn't either of them. <laughs> I did have a threesome once. I, I, I did genuinely, I had a threesome once. It was amazing. I was going out with a girl who was a twin, and, um, you know, so I asked. You don't ask, you don't get. I asked, I got. It was amazing. Because, if anything, her twin was better looking than her. And an all-round great guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up here, by the way. Can you stop? <laughs> I suppose, I mean, when it comes down, most men are, that ask for a threesome, the women think it's sexist. Do you, do you think it's sexist, ladies, if men ask for a threesome? No. No. Oh. <laughs> most women that aren't as liberal as these girls... <laughs> most women think that we're being sexist when we ask for a threesome, like, you're not enough woman for us, I need two women to satisfy my incredible sexual desires. That's not what we're saying, ladies, no. When we ask for a threesome, what we're saying is, wouldn't it be brilliant if, after sex, there was someone there for you to talk to? <laughs> Whenever I'm with two women, it's difficult enough to get a word in edgeways, let alone my cock. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a joke. I've never had any kind of problem. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> I don't like to generalise, but most women are pretty good at multitasking. Would you agree with that? You're pretty good at multitasking? Yeah. Yeah, so you don't need two women. Just get her to tickle your balls while she works the shaft. <laughs> my case. <laughs> well done. Next up it's Rufus. Rufus, say hello to the girls. Hello, ladies. <laughs> I'm being asked to argue that a threesome is better in real life uh, than in the imagination. It is. <laughs> but... There is a chasm of difference between saying, I've climbed Everest, and I was thinking of climbing Everest. <laughs> <laughs> there has never been, nor will there ever be, a heterosexual man born on Earth for whom the threesome is not held as the holy trinity of sexual accomplishment. <laughs> Every hero that has ever existed is rumoured to have indulged in physical congress with multiple partners. Errol Flynn, James Bond, John Sargent. <laughs> I think it stems from our... <laughs> Where do you think we got these two from? <laughs> <laughs> of course, your own performance within the threesome is better in imagination than in real life. 
In my head, a night of sexual sandwiching goes from dusk till dawn with more positions than a broken clothes source. <laughs> and of course, I know that in reality I'd be lucky to make it past taking my belt off before the hurried apologies and the toot of the minicab. <laughs> You see, if something resides solely in imagination, it is worthless. And I cannot reasonably expect to talk about the difference between imagination and reality without treading that path. So, ladies, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I realise we've now found ourselves in a camera run. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I can assure you, there is nothing about that that was better in the imagination. <laughs> Vote blue. I thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Marcus. Would you like to add anything to help out your teammates? Would I like to add anything? Add yeah, anything, I've got yeah. an idea. What I could add? <laughs> i just put the tip in, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I can't... No, I've... The words... You can't speak. I Stop. can talk perfectly well. <laughs> in my imagination, for example, the threesome uh, that it would never actually happen, so already imagination has won, there's no way the two of these uh, lovely ladies would be willing to indulge the kind of depravity that is going on in here, right? Now. <laughs> I got four grand that says they will. <laughs> okay. So, so is a threesome better in the imagination than in real life? Once again, the studio audience will decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Jimmy and Marcus. They think that three is a crowd in the bedroom. And it's a blue card for Rufus and Sarah. They'd like to make the beast with three backs. Dirty bastards. <laughs> Vote now. Stop that. <laughs> so it looks like a win for the Reds. Well done, Jimmy and Marcus. Yeah. Can, I, um, can I get them washed and brought to my room? <laughs> that is just a joke. Don't wash them. Thanks very much, Portia and Stacey. <laughs> Many sexual fantasies go unfulfilled, although I do keep hoping that one day I'll come home to find in my living room Liza Minnelli, an Alsatian and a crossbow. <laughs> so the Red Team have won this round, which means this week's winners are the Red Team. Oh. Well done, Marcus Brigstock and Jimmy Carr. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Sarah Millican. That's all we've got time for. Good night. On Sunday night, hog the sofa as we have back-to-back -back episodes of Billy Connolly's World Tour of Australia. Here on Dave Next, laughs of a satirical kind. From Have I Got News For You, 